also in the project and has worked a lot on um, gender issues. And Matina Papayanopoulou, who was one of our trainers, and Bula Turi, uh, who was assistant researcher. Uh, and they will also be contributing uh, during the day and we will all be available for any questions or discussions you might want to have. Um, so in this first presentation, um, I thought I would describe three recent incidences of sexual violence and or harassment perpetrated at different Greek universities, all three of which, which received some wider publicity and elicited institutional as well as activist responses. I will use these as case studies for formulating reflections and questions about what happens when there are no formal complaint or other kinds of redress procedures and care pathways in place at university. So Pantheon specifically, but all other Greek universities as well, do not have specific policies, services, or care pathways to deal with um, sexual violence and harassment at university. So we're talking now, I'm presenting about a context, about what happens in a context where there are no such policies as you might find, for example, in the UK. So I have three case studies in mind. I'll start and um, I'll see how far I get. Um, uh, yes, yes, please. <coughs> and uh, just before closing, I will formulate some main questions that I think we need to be considering when we're looking at the problem of sexual violence and harassment at university. So the first case, on June 21st of this year, a female student at the University of the Aegean in the town of Mitilini reported to the local police station being sexually attacked on June 19th in her hall of residence by a man from the student hall security personnel. The attacker, a 33-year-old man, employee of the security firm hired by the University of the Aegean to guard student residences, had been previously reported to the student hall manager by other female students for sexual harassment. The complaint was processed under rape legislation and the accused was detained for 48 hours before testifying in front of the public prosecutor. On the same day, the university rectorate responded with the following press release, which to um, some extent represented a kind of non-committal response. So this was the press release. The University of the Aegean, from the moment it received information about the legal complaint of attempted rape of one of our, of one of our female students, is in communication with the student and is variously supporting her scientifically and procedurally in all, in any and all matters and to the extent she chooses. So this is a very, um, a response that doesn't really give us any information about what they're doing. We are convinced that the relative court authorities of Mitilini will continue to act quickly and effectively in order to grant justice immediately. And here we see a kind of delegation of responsibility. So it's what the court will decide. The, 
the, the, the position that the university takes at this moment, at the first moment of this report, of the reporting of the case, is that it will follow the court's decision, basically. It does not make a statement of its own. Um, at the same time, the University of the Aegean and its members are working to secure a climate of calm and will continue to care for the safety and truly humane dwelling of our male and female students in the islands as a minimum expression of support to their own and their families' efforts as it has continuously done in the 30 years of its operation. And next comes this statement about wanting to keep the call uh, at university. So at, at no point during this first statement do we see any um, <coughs> concrete and, and strong um, position around the issue of sexual abuse and sexual violence. Uh, the accused, in the meantime, filed a counter complaint against the victim for false accusations testified on June 23rd and was then released awaiting trial a year and a half later. The above events, along with local social disapproval for the victim, in other words, lo wow, okay. yes, um, there was a lot of social disapproval for the victim expressed in local media saying, um, well, you know, she probably asked for it uh, and uh, you should uh, make sure, the university should make sure that students behave properly and we have no uh, local knowledge of this, of the accused being uh, a, a man of ill repute. So, following that, this triggered intense student reactions and mobilizations towards the university and local community including the occupation of the university rectorate and demonstration, demonstrations in the city center. The student assembly against the culture of rape publicized its own response, condemning the university on its <coughs> non-committal response, as well as for not terminating the contract with the security firm and the culture of surveillance in student halls. Um, and Incidents of verbal and physical violence against female student demonstrators by local men, friends of the accused, were reported in activist media. This in turn sparked further public reactions in the local media demanding that the university and police intervene to end the disruption of daily life, given also that it was the tourist season. And um, this also sparked uh, demonstrations and, and, and activist um, uh, and various activist responses in other Greek universities. So here is a poster from the demonstration in Mytilini. Oh, sorry. How is this one? Okay. Okay, uh, here is a um, poster from the demonstration, in, a photograph from the demonstration in Athens. Um, yeah, just you can look on it. I will stop with this case, um, but I want to raise the following questions. First of all, what we have to think about what kinds of incidents can be reported. In this case, as well as the other two that I have in mind, well, all, uh, in all cases, in all three cases, the perpetrators were outside, were not members of staff of the university. They were outside people. They were hired by the university through a private firm or through other um, avenues, but they were not members of staff of the university. So it seems that when the perpetrator is an outside person, it might be more easy to report uh, such cases, incidents of sexual violence. Uh, the second question is, what kinds of incidents count as sexual violence? In this instance, as well as in the others, it was a very clear case of a man abusing a woman, a female student, an older man abusing a female student sexually. Uh, so it, it, it falls very, very clearly in the kind of gender-based violence uh, notions we have. So it was a very, in a way, textbook case of sexual assault and harassment. 
uh, what happens when it's not such a clear case or when other gender and sexual identities are involved? Um, the third, given that in, our, in Greece there are no, um, as I said, formal care pathways or policies, institutional responses are conditioned by the identity of the institution, the microculture of the institution, as well as the relation of the institution to the local community. As we can see in the case of the University of the Aegean, it was local reactions either against the victim or by the students um, against the university that prompted uh, the university's further um, uh, more, more, more positive, let's say, um, uh, assuming responsibility later on. So it was the relationship between the university and the local community that was important in, in kind of steering the university how to deal with this. Um, okay, uh, fourth question. Is this, are these kinds of uh, examples, um, examples of new feminisms or new feminist identities that are growing out of and in the context of the university? Uh, how far is a feminist identification important for victims but also activists to take a stand against this? And <clears throat> what strategies are deployed by victims? As we have seen in this case, um, the victim chose, I mean, the victim chose a legal course of action and then in order to escalate the confrontation when the response by the university was not the um, expected one, she uh, publicized the event in local media. And I'll stop here and we can take it up more in the discussion. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for dealing with the technology. I don't think we'll be getting the clicker back, will we? Thank you. Tell them just the power wand. Okay, so thank you, Alexandra. Great. Um, I know you've got other case studies that also show what can happen where we act to avoid policies or welfare or care pathways. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Barbara Viglia from University of Ramiri in Vigili. Vigira in Vigili in Tarragona uh, in Catalonia. Um, should I give my microphone, or are you happy to use that? Yeah. 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 It works? Yeah. Uh, it's going to... <coughs> so is it possible to move with this, or just do a sign and... Uh... Uh, should work. Just waiting for I am done in the meantime, <laughs> just waiting. <laughs> yeah, okay, we need to, okay. It seems it's more complicated than, okay. So I'm, uh, as you say, uh, I come from, uh, the, from Catalonia, okay, so um, the experience, it's, it's so interesting uh, what the presentation of Alexander done because uh, exactly what he was uh, trying to present is uh, uh, some part of difficulty and uh, good practice that it starts from having a, a protocol of pathway and the, the limits of, of this. So is uh, many points, uh, there are many points of... Uh, <laughs> okay. There are many points of contents uh, between what she say without having a pathway and having a pathway actually. So one of the... Uh, one of the things is that uh, all the uh, Catalan uh, university have uh, a protocol, so a sort of uh, dog uh, way of acting care pathway, as you were saying, in order to deal with uh, uh, sexual violence. It's not working. Hey, can you move from there, maybe? If I do this, can you move from there? Okay. Anytime I do this, so it will be thanks. Okay. So <laughs> we solve this. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you will see me moving a lot. Um, 
Anyway, I'm Italian, so that's not a problem. <laughs> I, I mean, um, as I was saying, we have protocols, and these protocols are part of our public policy in order to attach sexual violence, okay? Um, I, some of the good problems, we have analyzing the, all the protocols of the Catalan University. Uh, one of the things is that, why does the university have uh, created a protocol? Most of the time because uh, it has been mandatory, okay? So the European community and then the... And then the... Uh, and then the uh, local uh, legislation forced the university to give some kind of response. So I think here is the first problem that is not really that uh, university, most of university believe that they have to do it, or, uh, or and there is a change of uh, attitude through sexual violence, uh, but is that if you don't know this, uh, you can uh, have troubles. And for what uh, I read about uh, the analysis of other country, I didn't see that it's so different in the other country we, we, we have lived. Obviously, uh, of the project. Obviously, in, in many places, uh, in many universities, there is groups of people that really want a change. It didn't mean, but it's institutionally, is not the main, is normally not the main point, okay? Uh, so, one of the problems is also that, as she was saying, that even in the portfolio or pathway, one of the big problems is uh, what is defined as sexual violence uh, and how is uh, normally restricted to, uh, to determinate kind of violence, uh, to some subject, uh, uh, to some uh, groups of people that work in the university. Uh, most of the uh, protocols uh, are not uh, made uh, in relation uh, with the family's perspective, but are more related with uh, uh, working legislation and rights of workers uh, in many cases. So they didn't uh, understand completely all the problems that uh, are behind a sexual violence uh, situation. Um, and in many cases, in some cases, there is a good dissemination, but in many cases, it's difficult for people to know exactly what they have to do if they if, if a sexual violence occur and uh, even if uh, if they know sometimes there is a lot of uh, repetition so second uh, victimization you have to, to tell your story many times to different people in order to finally find someone that will take some action and even if so it's they're still uh, waiting for you and then because obviously the competence of the university are not penal competence for example so at the same time, if it's, especially if it's something uh, uh, a big sexual violence, uh, uh, something uh, very important, you have to follow, or if you want, you can follow a court path. So you have to repeat things also in the other side. Okay? Uh, and the, the implementation uh, as many legislation as separate with many legislation, the implementation is really strict. You have to do this and this and this, but people are not, we are not striped, and the sexual violence situation are not striped, and the intersectionality make a big difference when you leave sexual violence, but in the, in the protocol or in the pathway, normally they are not really included. Uh, and uh, another big uh, problem is that the educative and preventive me measure are normally uh, less <coughs> developed than uh, the uh, education, that the, the pain out of care one, okay? So now we have a problem also with this, that's fabulous. Now technology today is, okay. No, so. Okay, uh, procedure are also very slow. And uh, uh, and many times uh, academic hierarchy uh, make uh, create problems in order to uh, act against uh, sexual violence, especially in cases in which uh, some uh, academic senior person is involved. That uh, we have, she was talking more on uh, sexual violence between students, but I think at least in South Europe, the big problem is also between staff and students or between staff of with different level of uh, establishment okay and power obviously uh, there is a lack of budgeting for prevention um, 
di uh, different uh, difficulty in uh, being very well known and trusted by the whole community. Many research uh, showed that people didn't trust uh, what the protocol is because many times what you can really do is much less than what you need. So it's sometimes it's happened like in, in Greece, even if there is a protocol or a pathway, mm -hmm. it's happened that you mm -hmm. become to be assaulted again. Uh, and that some part of the community can be really resistant, okay? Okay, so uh, one of the problem, uh, uh, for in my, in my way, uh, we should try to start to problematize the protocol or the pathways and to uh, think in how can we really manage to have a, po a politics, a policy that is much more uh, homogeneous, more integral, and this didn't just uh, say you have to do it like it was a law, a law and a path that you have to follow, <laughs> but it didn't uh, um, take in account all the community, all the space, and especially thinking about uh, university, uh, we are educa educative spaces and the educative practice that should be really reinforced in the policy against uh, uh, sexual violence. Uh, because in many times uh, this legal practice becomes uh, in uh, uh, homogenization of the experience of people and uh, deciding for the people so you are not able to to decide for yourself if you want to be held that you have to do this, otherwise you go out from the protocol. There is a very sensibilization about what it happened because we already have a protocol, we already have a pathway, we are safe, we don't have to do nothing else, as if we are not producing every day a culture that supports sexual violence. Uh, and uh, um, as she was saying, we reduce also the agency of the community. We didn't take in account enough all the different community, not just within the university, but also outside of the university, because we work, we will live in a space that is not is isolated, and this has to be considered. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, finally, there is uh, like always uh, in this case uh, a, a little bit of uh, uh, limitation of feminist claim. Uh, a co-option of feminist claim in something that it seems uh, sometimes worshipped. Okay. Pink washing? Okay, sexual violence, cold washing, I don't know how can you call it. Uh, so, as I was saying, uh, I think university uh, may start to rethink, a good practice will be starting to rethink collectively uh, how do we want a culture of respect no gender discrimination uh, within the university instead of just ans uh, thinking on what kind of answer we have to do in case of a sexual assault. Uh, obviously, we, we still uh, need to give some answer, but uh, this is not enough in order to change uh, the situation. So, uh, what we are suggesting, and this is a, is a, is a part that we also propose in, uh, in the training, in our training we were training people to this, is uh, the importance of uh, forced acknowledge and understand or perceive the existence of the different kind of sexual violence in the university. I recognize that there is a problem, but that this is not a problem of single people but it's a problem of the institution itself. Listening carefully what does people want and uh, how they are living this, this experience, accompanying them, I don't know how to pronounce this word, uh, taking care of all the moments and all the process that in different parts of the process you have different needing and it cannot be just, okay, we already give you the answer, that's not enough, and uh, also, continues to reflect and uh, evaluate, reflect and change our uh, proposal. Thank you very much. I think Joaquin will go to speak more about this uh, in, the, in the training in the afternoon. Okay, so our third speaker is Isa Skoon Andreva, 
who is from Basque Country and is based at UPNA there. And I think has several roles as expert in the area and as participant on training. Is that right? You Thanks. Yes? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, my name is Itashuna Wetla. I, I come from um, Pamplona, a part of, uh, I don't know, Basco. I, I have taken a picture of a map to situate uh, the city. Uh, uh, and I'm coming from a university that has been part of this project, but in a different level, because we have been one of the benefits uh, uh, yeah. partners we have received for uh, training uh, from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One more? Yeah. One more? Yeah, yeah, no, I was just in the first one. No, I don't know how we are going to do this because I have a lot of uh, <laughs> animation, so <laughs> it's going to be quite uh, strange. <laughs> yeah? Okay, uh, perhaps I will do like that, otherwise it's almost impossible, sorry. <coughs> so, um, we were asked uh, to talk about uh, good practices in supporting the students disclosing social or sexual violence. So, first we thought it's okay, uh, the, it must happen, an, an act of sexual violence, then uh, the possible victim or su uh, survivor have to act uh, rebelling and then we have to uh, support them. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think we have here some of the recommendations. They are not mine. They are from the team of the past country of uh, what we can do when uh, somebody comes saying that has uh, suffered this kind of uh, sex uh, violence so I think uh, Joaquin will talk about them in the afternoon so that's perfect because I'm not expert in this one but you can see that there are a lot of things that uh, you can do or you should do okay uh, in the afternoon we will talk about that and then I was thinking that there was a kind of uh, small trap in this because that's not easy in practice uh, we have some studies that say, says that uh, the majority of the female victims of violence do not report their experience either to the police or to an organization that supports victims of this type of uh, offenses. In our university, uh, we have not experienced uh, supporting victims of uh, students that have uh, suffered this kind of violence. Um, so, it's not possible to apply these wonderful recommendations. So, it's a pity. But uh, I thought that it would be interesting to reflect and learn from our uh, experience because I think this is like recommendations for the top. I mean, but a lot of universities are not there. Uh, uh, students don't come to us and we cannot help if we are waiting for that. So, yes. I thought uh, it was another logic under the what is uh, it was happening. It's not like a line because it's more like a circle. It's an interactive process that uh, we have different elements and all of them are connected between them. And it's very very important the context. What I think and I will try to uh, explain it in a practical way. Okay. Everything is. Uh, I think we have to think about, for example, when we uh, are talking about act of sexual violence, what is considered as sexual violence by the actors and especially students, who are the victims and who uh, the guilty, or and what can we do with the students to help identify identifying social violence? I think it's uh, some of the clue questions because sometimes they, uh, the students are suffering these kind of situations and they are not aware that are um, sexual violence. So 
uh, if they don't uh, are if they are not aware then probably they will not talk with anything they will not disclose uh, about that or. so when this, uh, thinking about this classing uh, when do we consider that the victim has disclosure when uh, she discloses to a friend or to a professional for example uh, who do the students talk with about these issues and how can we be close to students to listen and help them? And uh, thinking about the kind of support, who gives the support actually? What kind of support do we give? And when is the support given? And thinking about that, uh, I think uh, we try to uh, think on. Uh, about uh, our specific context, the uh, public University of Navarre, and uh, even we have not applied this uh, recommendation. I think we have good practices uh, in a, if uh, we think in a wider sense of supporting the students uh, disclosing social violence. And then now I have to yeah, okay. This is public University of Navarre. Yeah, I told you we are there somewhere. <laughs> And it's a small, it's a public university, it's quite young, uh, it's a small, we are like uh, 9,000, more than 9,000 people at the university and the 84% are students. There are three campuses. <laughs> okay, uh, wait here. And I think it's important to know, uh, just a little bit, you, you see this block, uh, the big one. All the courses are uh, teach, we teach there. We have number 24 there. It's a small uh, residence, hall of residence. So five minutes, okay. Uh, and uh, we are not. We don't do too much. Uh, we don't live too much uh, at the university. I mean, people live in their houses usually because uh, students are from Navarra, the majority of them, and they are located uh, mainly in the first one, uh, this one. Building. Okay. Uh, this is okay. We have a lot of ser services, uh, and among them, we have a, a quality unit, <laughs> and uh, it's quite new. Uh, and it's like Barbara told us, uh, in compliance with the state of uh, state legislation, the university had to create this unit. Uh, it was not because uh, our um, uh, rector was very um, uh, okay. Yeah, no, it was not feminist, but uh, they had to. Okay, so uh, this is the unit that has to contribute to the education of gender violence, harassment, and abuse due to the gender in the university environment. And in the same situation, we had to develop, as Barbara told us, a protocol for prevention and so on just to see the context. Okay. okay, I think protocol is an important tool. Um, in our case, um, it's important that it's applied for all the students, all community, and also from, uh, for people who come to the university to do, uh, for example, to a conference, if something happens, so that's interesting. Um, uh, it's not complaint required, and we have some interesting things, but I have to pass it. But more than the opportunities, I think we have limits. Uh, and some of them are linked with what Barbara told us, that our politicians are not very feminist, <laughs> and uh, we have had a lot of problems with them. Um, uh, nobody, the, uh, nobody knows the, uh, the protocol at the university because it's not it's, uh, invisible, more or less. It's, it doesn't appear at the web page, uh, just in a very uh, small uh, uh, place, but it's impossible, so it's unknown for the university or for the community. Okay, so. Uh, oh. Okay, so I think uh, with this political resistance, lack of sensitivity and interest, uh, imagination and creativity is required for, in this case, uh, the responsible of uh, this politics, um, the equal unity. Um, 
and I think in this context, um, I think it's important to know our university, our situation, and see what kind of practices we consider that are good for supporting students uh, disclosing uh, sexual violence. Uh, we have uh, trained and ready professionals. It's not this technical that is uh, full-time working at the quality unit. It's important, but we also have a psychologist, very interesting person, very well formed. So we have the proper space. Um, it's very close to students. It's located in that building I told you we have classes, so it's the space. Uh, you can, uh, it confidentially is guaranteed. Uh, I think it's uh, there is a very good coordination among professionals, uh, and this can help uh, not only for. Um, um, okay, for supporting in a, a very concrete uh, or narrow perspective, but uh, for example, I think it's important uh, the coordination with teachers because uh, we, uh, for example, me and other teachers, um, give uh, formation to students. Uh, in my case, I teach in social work. We usually or sometimes uh, make like diagnosis about uh, yeah uh, our situation at the university and so um, they are working a lot on prevention and training and I think it's a way of supporting also and they are training the students in collaboration okay with uh, teacher and staff and so on and there are a lot of awareness campaigns and I think it's the way uh, of uh, getting uh, close to this. Um, uh, issue and the way we are trying to support the students at this moment. I think uh, I had uh, a video but that uh, I have taken today from the uh, newspaper because uh, tomorrow we have a very big festival in our university like uh, 5,000 students uh, usually go to there and it's one of the very hot <laughs> moments where can happen this kind of things and uh, and today uh, it's a campaign, it's a video, but I think we cannot see because. Uh, uh, but if you want, it's the, yeah. it was in the PowerPoint with a link, but it's not possible. So that's, that was what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. the different contexts where there's an equalities unit in the university that then becomes the obvious place to disclose. And I think that's quite different for the UK context where we might have a, a team of 50 people in some universities in the UK who are part of the welfare and student support team. So that's a, a very interesting. Thank you for that, Suzanne. So our final speaker is Ruth Lewis from Northumbria University speaking um, of a UK context now and a different external relationship but a wider angle on the issues. Okay, thank you. So is this working okay? Yeah, great. Okay, thank you very much, Pat. Um, yeah, so I'm Ruth Lewis and I'm from Northumbria University and I'm not part of the um, project and the partnership team, but I'm really delighted that at Northumbria <laughs> University we're one of the pilots for Vanita Sundaram's project um, whereby we're training staff to um, become better first responders to disclosures of sexual violence. So I'm currently wading through <coughs> the university bureaucracy to try to get that actually off the ground, which itself is a, um, a learning about how universities can slow down action around this. So the panel so far has, has spoken from positions of, of expertise and knowledge and experience about how best to support students who disclose. And I wanted to anticipate the next panel that looks more at cultural change in institutions, to think really about how we make the links between the two. So how we make sure that supporting students who disclose is linked to wider institutional and cultural change. And to do that, I want to talk a bit about the sort of history of Violence against women and girls to start with. So, can we move on to the next slide? I'll do the. I had some lovely animation, and each of these was going to come up as a surprise. 
<laughs> but too bad. Okay, so uh, if we start with women at the centre of this um, image, and women who are survivors of violence, various forms of violence, sexual violence, domestic violence, sexual harassment, and so on, the movement of violence against women and girls, or what we now know as gender-based violence, grew out of women supporting each other against men's violence. So that's the, the top image there is supposed to depict that. So women got together in various sorts of groups to support each other, to provide refuge for each other, to help women who are living with violence, recovering from violence, fleeing violence. And from this very practical mutual support offered on a shoestring with very very little if any state involvement it was absolutely grassroots um, action about women supporting each other from this work the women developed a theoretical analysis of the violence as part of a wider system of patriarchal oppression so that's the, the image on your right of the thinker, the, the woman's version of the thinker, of Rodin's thinker. So women using their observation, their understanding, their interpretation of lived experiences of violence against them, men's violence against them, using that to theorise, to understand, to interpret this phenomenon as part of a wider systems of patriarchal oppression. And I know I'm going to glide over years of uh, constructive conflict and dispute and argumentation between women theorists and activists about how we understand violence against women and girls. So we don't have time to go into all of that. That has led us now to thinking much more about intersectional approaches to understanding violence against women and girls. But from this lived experience and then from the theorising, we saw tremendous campaigning and activism over decades. Um, so activists and scholars were involved in knowledge production about men's violence against women and girls or gender-based violence. And that brought public, institutional and political attention to the phenomenon. So the, the image down here at the bottom is of South All Black Sisters using the legal system to ensure that smaller specialist services were provided. So as well as trying to change the legal system to better respond to instances of gender-based violence, activists also used the legal system to protect services that were at risk of being cut. So what all this activism has done over recent decades has brought this, this issue into much sharper focus for the wider politics, the wider publics, and institutions where gender-based violence happens. And feminist scholars and activists have brought a, a really sharp focus on the failure of institutions to prosecute perpetrators or to protect victims and survivors. And they've really argued that we need to criminalise acts of gender-based violence that have traditionally been made invisible. And, and this has all led, undoubtedly, to significant changes in how the criminal justice system responds to the material circumstances of perpetrators and victims, as well as to some symbolic social change so that we, we, we think differently to an extent about gender-based violence now than we did 50 years ago. In relation to gender-based violence in universities, this has led to responding to individual incidents, to individual cases, and institutions developing the policies, procedures, and protocols that Barbara has talked about that can lead to a certain sense of complacency. If we've got the policies, there's nothing more we need to do. We've got the policies in place, we're complying. And in the US, this kind of bureaucratic approach and the use of Title IX, which in the UK we tend to think of, or have traditionally thought of as a fantastically progressive piece of legislation, that is now being criticised by activists and scholars because, it, because the way it's being implemented in the US is losing its victim-centred approach. So the institutional compliance with regulations is prioritised above 
victim well-being, as we've heard other speakers refer to. So we've seen how bureaucratic approaches, which are typical of neoliberal audit cultures, prioritise the reputation of institutions above the well-being of actual victims or potential victims. So we can see how our our work that has progressive potential can become jeopardised by the kind of bureaucratic drivers in universities. So I think it's worth asking the question now whether the focus on criminalising individual perpetrators has caused us as a movement to, to take our eyes slightly off the ball around cultural change. So it's hard to argue, even with the current sudden, extraordinary attention to sexual harassment in Hollywood and Parliament, and you know, we all in this room are probably thinking, why are you suddenly interested? We've been talking about this for decades. Why the sudden interest? It's extraordinary, isn't it? So despite this sudden interest, it's very hard to argue that social attitudes have really changed radically. And research, particularly with young people in Scotland, it, um, more widely in the UK, Nancy Lombard's, Christine Barter's, Han's work, Benita's work, work in Australia by Anita Harrison and colleagues, all reveals that young people by and large continue to tolerate gender-based violence, especially if the victim breaks gendered social norms. So despite the more public performances of condemnation of gender-based violence, the everyday reality and experiences are that gender-based violence continues in universities and outside of universities to be condoned, justified, and made invisible. And this is, I think, what Evan Stark was talking about when he referred to the stalled revolution, that in focusing on incidents and harms and individuals, we've paid less attention to the causes of gender-based violence, the structural inequalities that scaffold gender-based power relations. So we've a lot of work to do in changing wider community attitudes. And I'd like us to think about how we connect work in universities to ensure that there is suitable support for victims in a way that that work doesn't become disentangled from the wider work to change cultural and institutional and community attitudes. And I have a few suggestions about what this might mean in practice, but I'm sure other people will, uh, will have many more based on their own experiences. But clearly, what is needed and what we've all been arguing for is a holistic institutional approach that links all aspects of work. The preventative work, the student activism, the support for students who do disclose, the disciplinary procedures. And this might be overseen by some sort of task force that they have in several universities, including, for example, Durham University. And it's very important that this task force pays attention to the dynamics of meetings and of relationships within the membership of the task force to make sure that the student voice and the survivor voice is expressed and is heard. One of the things that this group could oversee is a review of cases, incidents, that have been dealt with. And here we might be able to borrow from the work that has been done in terms of intimate partner violence where we've paid a lot of attention to multi-agency collaboration, recognising that women victims have traditionally fallen through the gaps between agencies. And Ellen Pence's work on safety and accountability audits, which reviews how organisations have provided safety and have placed responsibility on the perpetrators might be helpful for us to think about in universities. Clearly in these, in these task force kind of partnerships, we need community organisations at the centre as well to bring their expertise and knowledge. We also need the expertise and knowledge within universities. I think there's been a tendency that others have noted that universities haven't drawn, always drawn on the expertise of scholars in their own institutions. And perhaps scholars working in this area, particularly in the UK, I'm not sure if this is impacting in the same way in other European countries, are so sort of driven by the kind of audit culture in academia, where we have to be producing referable outputs all the time, it becomes quite hard to dedicate time to other activities. And it's particularly difficult if you have a less secure position, so perhaps earlier career researchers are less able to engage in this, this kind of activism in universities. 
So just to, to summarise, we might think of having a, a jigsaw of approaches which draw in all of this tradition of um, the, the gender-based violence movement where we have legal and disciplinary responses, national policy frameworks, individual institutional policies and protocols as well as services and interventions focused on cultural change and student-based activism whereby the student, the survivor voice is heard loud and clear in these activities. Remembering all the times that the vast majority of incidents of sexual violence are not disclosed and are not reported. So we need to keep both that narrow perspective and focus and a much wider focus and pull together, integrate all these different parts of the jigsaw that we're working on. Okay, thank you. Okay, so of course we couldn't have a panel to think about good practice without getting drawn into talking about the politics of the issues and the institutional locations, the cultural politics, and the dynamics of, of uh, dancing with the legal framework that narrows and restricts achievements. So thank you for those reminders, Ruth, about uh, the experience and putting survivor experience at the um, and of course the uh, range of experience and that gets disclosed in that picture too. And also I think for thinking about the um, that all survivors need to be heard well and the extent of male sexual abuse and abuse of men for gender non-conforming as well as violence, uh, horrific and victimisation and LGBT uh, people. So widening the frameworks developed by feminists and ensuring that all survivors are held by the processes of good practice. I know we've run onto our lunch, onto our no, coffee break, but we, it's a half hour coffee break, so we could take 10 minutes of discussion now and still have nearly 20 minutes of coffee break. Is that tolerable? Does that seem a good idea? So are there questions or comments that people or panel members would like to make of each other um, at this point? There'll be other chances to discuss later on and a longer discussion in the next one. Are there points for in this 10 minutes? I've got one point of clarification I can just make while I'm looking at questions, which is that there's, there's a, the confusion over how many more training models there are. Could be that the Spanish, um, the two big Spanish teams, the Basque and the Catalan team, work together and derive a common model, and then work with it in different languages and different university contexts. So that's why sometimes we're talking about different numbers of models. I think in the UK, the universities each developed their own. Um, they were at different points in terms of good practice already, <coughs> especially perhaps, and developed from those points different frameworks. Uh, yes. I'm trying to understand um, exactly the outcome of the research so far. The target is and for each country's research a specific model, which is country specific, for how to kind of bring all of this together. people in different institutional and national contexts could look at a model and wonder and, and think about whether that fits their context because they're quite simple. If I say they're quite simple, you would fill in the details about those referrals, about those systems, about care pathways if they exist, about um, other university policies they connect to. So that's 
So yeah, that's my point at the start about this being disastrous for research. We can't do comparative research with this, but we can create good services. I mean, I can understand. I can appreciate it. hope the former. We certainly hope that each, as each partner writes their eval local evaluation report, that is the document that we will hold on the project website, that lasting, that the lasting project website, but also that we hope that they'll use in their institutions to move forward. So there will be a loop, at least one cycle of learning on the piloting during this project. Sometimes it's actually been two pilot states, two sort of loops around that because it's been piloted at the partner university and then at an associate partner university. Was referring to Northumbria as a sort of an associate partner rolled out later. So there might be chance to, um, they may have evolved through several different um, terms, but we're certainly hoping that as they, if they can become embedded, that it's with the revised, refined program. And in some cases, we're finding that different lengths of, um, different lengths in terms of hours needed of training or education programs are being used differently ongoing. So it might be that there's been, um, during, the, during the course of the project, there have been two-day training courses, and that after the project, these become slimmed down to a couple of hours that managers can ask people to attend. I think that what, uh, basically what you're saying, I, I think that is something we are going to develop from now. More, uh, more not comparative analysis exactly, but a more qualitative learning. And the center is the project have been around for one year and a half, more or less. So we have designed, uh, evaluate, put in practice, and evaluate the, the different models in very different contexts. So we didn't have the time to go in deep in the analysis of uh, of learning, uh, comparative learning. But I think it's something that uh, we we are planning to do with uh, article and new projects now. Yeah, and the final chapter of our um, main project report, the final project report, the final chapter is lessons across the models, so lessons overall. Yeah, so that'll be on the website. Yay, yeah, 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 yeah. and the shame that's so associated with sexual violence. And, and as you say, it's really difficult for, for 
for universities to, to counter this, especially without um, uh, victims wanting that to happen. Um, but having public statements, just in good old fashioned ways around using posters, using online spaces to, um, to, to publicize the fact that the university knows that, that sexual violence happens on its campus and is concerned about it and wants to do something about it. So, you know, there have been some fantastic campaigns, I think, by Great Crisis and by Women's Aid and amongst others over recent years. And we can perhaps get our institutions to borrow some of those messages to have them as, you know, social, um, websites and social media as well are, are fantastic opportunities, aren't they, to, to make statements. We then have to get the university to back up that statement, of course, that's a whole different story. But we can, we can use some of these um, forms of publicity to try to break down some of the ideas about shame and stigma and privacy and so on. I think we have saw the rape crisis campaign and some of the um, Italian government and some of the uh, anti-rape posters on these, not all of these boards, but on some of these boards. Okay, oh, last couple of minutes, one, two. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, right, right. Maria Tuff from the University of Wolverhampton. Um, just the question about intersectionality. I was just wondering if any of the partners would like to share perhaps any uh, views or maybe any ideas about how intersectionality was addressed uh, in the project, if at all. I was thinking particularly the issues with regards to sexuality, but also racism, given the you know, exacerbation of racism within European, the European context. So anything with regards to intersectionality well, in relation to the experience of violence, but, but also with regards to the training, perhaps? One example from uh, the okay. training program I did was um, when I'm making sure some of the case studies had diverse, uh, were kind of diverse survivors, diverse experience, and diverse genders. And also think about how different cultural, different cultural forms of shame or personalization or responsabilization might be operating in someone's difficulty in disclosing. Thank you. We introduced the intersectionality in the in the training, in the contents of the training. It's obviously difficult, especially I don't know in other countries, but at least in Catalonia and I think also in the Basque country, to that this uh, already the, the problem of uh, gender violence uh, is not completely well understood, and when you wide it and then sexual violence, you're why it's, it's sometimes more difficult to not, the, the, the problem is uh, how to be able to open it without uh, uh, dilute the, the fight against it, you know? So, but, but we, we introduce uh, uh, in the content, um, uh, for example, we, we prepare case of sexual violence and they were not just <laughs> aggression from a man to, to a woman, but they were also related with uh, uh, different expression of uh, gender and uh, different kind of, uh, of a situation. And also we analyze how does power and gender power have uh, operate in the specificity of this uh, case and how it can operate and it uh, affected the response. Would you like to make your question a comment or something very brief or throw it out and we could answer it later in the day? Okay. Would that be possible? Well, I just wanted to echo it. I kind of like lost the momentum of this earlier on. I'm also from the East Lincoln University. My name is Guy Turgoops. I'm from uh, Tom Hoffman and I wanted to echo what I have. I feel like you're a colleague because it's like another East Lincoln University. So there are a few things that resonate with me and that we can say we're all talking about. I'm an academic. Uh, how we keep stable uh, 
Um, but I'm also really interested, because we've been asked to do some training for those responders. I'm actually exposed to responders as well, so I've got different caps on. Um, and that's mainly about managing backlash um, from, unfortunately, all the colleagues in the university um, um, about the stereotypes. So just a comment, really. So it underlines the point about the need for a community education where colleagues aren't supporting the interventions, but also flagging up this issue about sustainability, which I think we want to think about in at least two ways, within the university after the end of funding, within, you know, culturally after the end of this blip of attention. Um, I'm also concerned about the pressure that we're putting on <coughs> especially services. In the time of the service, yeah, absolutely, service pressures. So we're going to stop now. We've got a very quick 10-minute coffee break. If you could grab a coffee and then we're back in here for the panel.